Today I'd like to talk to you about one of the most well-known personages in Asian colonial history, Raffles. Yes, that Raffles, Thomas Stamford Raffles, or Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles. We think we know the man very well, but do we? As usual in history, what you read in the books and what you see in the statue may not quite correlate to what really happened. And Raffles is just such a personage. His life is actually completely contrary to what we believe it was. We know Raffles in one breath with Singapore. The interesting thing is though, that of all the time he was ever in Asia, he only spent nine months in Singapore. He spent many years doing something completely different that almost broke his reputation and almost wrote him out of the history books completely. Let's start. Raffles was born in 1871 on a slave ship called the Anne. His father was a slave ship captain when slavery was still legal. However, his father died when Raffles was still quite young. And at that point, his prospects were rather dim. He was not greatly socially connected, lower middle class. Best idea was to find him a job in a company and that was the East India Company, where he started at 14 years old as a junior clerk. 1805, something very strange slash miraculous happens. From complete clerk obscurity, Raffles gets a 2,000% raise in wage. Not only that, he gets offered the job to become the assistant uh, manager and secretary to the governor of Penang, one of the most exalted positions in the East. Why would that possibly happen? Strangely enough, concurrent with getting all the goodies, he also got married. Well, so far so good. What's the problem with that? Well, he got married to a lady called Olivia. And Olivia happened to be 10 years his senior. Okay, so what's wrong with that? She was not only 10 years his senior, she was also his boss's lover in England. So the game was very simple. His local boss in England had this woman for a lover. And she was quite fun and gregarious and she liked a bit of liquid. <laughs> so the boss said, it's time for me to move on with my life. How do I equitably exit the situation? Raffles, mind giving a hand? I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. And Raffles went like, heck yeah, I'll take the offer. Cause Raffles was a social climber. And that's not a bad thing. He just knew when his boat was coming and he says, I'll take this lady off your hand and I'll move to Asia with her. Problem solved. <sighs> Everybody could move on gracefully. Upon arrival in Asia, something else happened in history. The Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon invaded Holland. What does that have to do with England? A lot. Because the Dutch government said to England, look, do us a favor, could you please take over our colonial possessions globally in trust until such time that we all have vanquished Napoleon and when this is over, mind you returning our, our holdings to us. England said, sure thing, we'll do that. Order came through down to Asia to Lord Minto. The local Asian boss right now of Raffles. You have to go to Indonesia or Java and manage Java for the Dutch in trust. Minto handed off the order to Raffles to do some fine tuning. Raffles started looking at the map and went like, wait a second, sure we'll take all this in trust, Sumatra, Java, and all that, you know, the Dutch holdings. But there is one thing that I would like to keep after this whole thing is over, and that is an island, the island of Banka. What is Banka? Well, Banka is an island that is south of Singapore, close to the Sumatran coast, and why the heck Banka? Very simple, two reasons. First of all, strategic location that was almost similar to Singapore. Second reason, it was very rich in tin. So essentially, Raffles' plan from the beginning was to yes, follow the orders given by his boss and go, okay, we'll protect the Dutch holdings, but he wanted them to annex the island of Banka and keep it for the British interests. How was he to achieve that feat? Well, he wanted to do the following thing. Sumatra was then under the Sassarenti, or under the control of the Javanese sultans. And there was another sultan in a town called Benkulu or Benkulen, to which this island then belonged. He started writing letters to this sultan and going, hey, listen up, 
we're coming down here, Shh, don't tell anybody, we're gonna be on your side. Um, tell you what, we'll send you a gift of 80 muskets, uh, feel free to do whatever you feel with them and because the Dutch people in your, in your city of Ben Coolen, they won't have much to say anymore. So wink wink, you've got a free hand to wish as you do. And he did. The fact is that the Sultan of Ben Kulu actually massacred the Dutch inhabitants. That in turn, Machiavelli is listening, gave eventually Raffles the reason to be able to attack this man because he hoped that his letters to him would stay secret. That means that this man has attacked all these poor unarmed colonists that gives you the right to attack his town of Ben Kulen and then keep the island of Banka as a prize. Pretty much upon arriving in Java, the whole Banka fracas was in full swing. And that means that he was able to send his troops over there, attack Ben Kulu, get rid of the Sultan and take over Banka, which for a short time was called the Duke of York Island. Now that he was in Java, he looked around and said, what can I do next? And there were the two great Sultanates, Surakarta and Jogjakarta, or Solo and Jogjakarta. The Dutch had found a way to kind of have an understanding with both sultans that they could live with each other friendly. These sultans were largely independent and ran their sultanates as they saw fit, which did not quite sit well with our friend Raffles. He wanted to have control. Not knowing what kind of a cat Raffles was, these two sultanates started playing politics with each other. And the sultanate of Surakarta sent a letter to Raffles saying, these bad people from Jogjakarta, you know, they're, they're, they're planning against you, you know, they will try to attack you, which was not really true, because they hoped that he would actually attack Jogjakarta, diminish Jogjakarta, so Surakarta could rise in power and prestige. Of course, Raffles knew what was being played, but he played along with it. And so he actually went and did attack Jogjakarta and wiped out Jogjakarta and took military control of Jogjakarta. At the same time, Surakarta thought that they would have one big time. Ah, uh -uh. he also subjugated Surakarta. And this was the complete flip around, the turn of the real colonization, the military colonization of Java by Raffles. Now, Raffles had now seemingly won everything. The only problem was that he had promised his bosses that this would make money. It takes money to run a war. And he had promised his overlords to make it work financially. He says, not a problem. I'm gonna introduce a new taxation on land and produce. Then I will do business with the Americans who will buy my good Javanese coffee. Only problem was that in 1812, the American US war was on and no US ship showed up to buy his coffee. Okay, tell you what, we'll import textiles from England to sell it to the Javanese. They imported textiles. First wash, the dyes came out. That was the end of the textile business. No Javanese wanted the textiles. We still have the tin from Banka, that island. It wasn't as rich as he had hoped it would be. Last straw, opium. Why opium? Because they had made a lot of money selling Indian opium to the Chinese and got China hooked on opium. And he actually tried to get Java hooked on opium, which didn't quite work out, thank God, for Java. In the end, after four or five years of running the show in Java, he had left a smoking financial hole. But in the meantime, he'd been quite busy looting temples and taking artwork and silver and jewelry. And by the time he left for England, he was actually in disgrace with his own company, but he was 20 tons richer for loot. Oh my God! Wow! So upon the arrival in England, he was almost persona non grata. In the meantime though, because he was quite clever and a great self-promoter, he had published a book called The History of Java, which he purportedly had written himself. Not quite true. Quite a lot of it was ghostwritten and he had borrowed quite a lot of it. Never mind. That book actually put him back into the circles of society and made some money for him. Raffles was, of course, not too happy about his fall from grace. He felt very wrong. The man had a very interesting, egomaniacal view of himself that nothing he did was ever wrong, even though the numbers said so differently. He actually went and applied for a 500 pound a year 
a retirement fund from the East India Company. And they were like, are you nuts? I mean, you leave us with a smoking hole in our accounts. Tell you what, you owe us 22,000 pounds, which was quite a lot of money. It's about 1 million US dollars in today's currency. Of course, the guy couldn't cough it up. What did the East India Company do? They said, tell you what, we're gonna get rid of you. We're gonna send you back to Sumatra, back to Ben Kulin, and you're gonna live your days out there and we won't have any problems with you anymore. So it was that he landed in Ben Kulin, a little town up the river, mosquito infested a swamp, and he was very, very unhappy about that, obviously. And it is at this point that Singapore started coming up on the horizon and it became a reality for the East India Company. In comes Raffles again and squeezes his way past his bosses who said, have a look at the island, see if it works, but do not make any treaties that contravene our agreement with the Dutch colonial powers. If they've got any rights on this area on the island, do not touch. Raffles went in and always under the same subterfuge of, ooh, sorry, I had to, I had to move fast because you guys are too far away and we didn't have internet then. He actually brokered some mm, treaties that might not quite hold up to scrutiny with the local potentates, and he thus founded Singapore. The fact is that he only stayed in Singapore for nine months of his life. From that, he went back to Ben Kulin in 1842, and he went back to England. But karma is interesting, because the ship on which he had loaded all his books, all his money, all his artwork burned down in the harbor before they even left for England. Upon arrival to England, he was a broken man. Almost all his children from his second marriage had died. He was pretty much in disrepute and died a lonely death. To find out more about this rip-roaring actual history of the man, which is full of deeds of valor, piracy, uh, drunkenness, uh, loot, this is the book to read that I highly recommend you get. It's a page turner. I literally took this book up and couldn't stop reading it. Raffles, The British Invasion of Java by Tim Hannigan. The link is below. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share.